Bereshit, Genesis 10.6 And the sons of Ham, Cush, Mitzrayim, and Put, and Canaan, and the sons of Cush, Seba, Hawalah, and Sabta, and Ramah, and Sabteca, and the sons of Ramah, Sheba, and Dedan. And Cush brought forth Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one on the earth. Notice that Sheba was a descendant of Ham and was the son of Cush and the brother of Nimrod, the ruler of the first world order. The name Sheba seems to show up all throughout scripture when a calamity is about to ensue, as we will investigate in the study. But first let's look at what Strong tells us about the name Sheba, which is Hebrew Strong's 7614, and it means seven or an oath. Sheba shows up a lot in scripture when a calamity is about to take place, like in Job when Satan asked to tempt Job. Job 1.8 And Yahuwah said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? That there is none like him on the earth, a perfect and straight man, one who fears Elohim and turns aside from evil. And Satan answered Yahuwah and said, Is Job fearing Elohim for naught? Have you not made a hedge around him, and around his household, and around all that he has on every side? Have you blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land? But stretch out your hand, please, and strike all that he has, if he would not curse you to your face. And Yahuwah said to Satan, See, all that he has is in your hand, only do not lay a hand on himself. And Satan went out of the presence of Yahuwah. And the day came to be when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in the house of their brother, the firstborn. And a messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding alongside them when Sheba fell upon them and took them away. And they struck the servants with the edge of the sword. And I alone have escaped to inform you. Notice the first calamity of Job came in the name of Sheba after Satan was allowed to strike Job. And it would be a woman by the name of Bathsheba, her name meaning daughter of an oath, Hebrew Strong 33:39. She would lure King David into sinning, 2 Samuel 11:2, and it came to be at evening time that David rose up from his bed and walked about on the roof of the sovereign's house. And from the roof he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very good to look at. And David sent and asked about the woman, and one said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? And David sent the messengers to fetch her, and she came to him, and he lay with her, for she was cleansing herself from her uncleanliness, and she returned to her house. Notice how in this passage that the adulterous woman led King David into this sin, and it led him also into another sin by sending her husband to the grave. Adultery is a sin that leads to many other sins. King David repented of these sins that it brought upon him in Psalms 51. Show me favor, O Elohim, according to your loving commitment, according to the greatness of your compassion. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me completely from my guilt, and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. I'm not going to read the entire psalm in this study, but I recommend you go and read this very heartfelt repentance that King David wrote to Yahuwah. Later there would be an uprising against David by an evil man named Sheba. 2 Samuel 20 verse 1 And there came to be a man of Belial, whose name was Sheba, son of Bichri, a Benjamite. And he blew the shofar and said, We have no part in David, nor do we have an inheritance in the son of Yeshai. Each one to his tents, O Yisrael. Then all the men of Israel deserted David to follow Sheba, the son of Bichri. But the men of Yehuda from the Yardin as far as Jerusalem clung to their sovereign. 
Notice in this passage that Sheba was a man of Belial. This word is Hebrew Strong's 1100 and means worthlessness, destruction, ungodliness, and wicked. Quote, Belial is a term occurring in the Hebrew Bible Old Testament, which later become personified as the devil in Christian texts of the New Testament. So Sheba, son of Bickery, was a man of the devil. Once again, the name Sheba associated with evil and Satan. Unfortunately, the sins of David would follow him unto his death. After the death of his elder brothers Ammon and Absalom, Adonai considered himself to be the next heir to the throne. But if he would sit on the throne, then Queen Bathsheba and her son Solomon would be considered sinners and would be killed. Bathsheba was approached by the prophet Nathan to go before King David to save her and Solomon's life. 1 Kings 1.18 And now look, Adonai has become sovereign, and now my master, the sovereign, you do not know about it, and he has slaughtered great numbers of bulls and fatlings and sheep, and has invited all the sons of the sovereign, and Abirathar the priest, and Joab the commander of the army. But he did not invite Shilamo your servant. And you, my master, O sovereign, the eyes of all Yisrael are on you, to declare them who is going to sit on the throne of my master, the sovereign, after him. Otherwise it shall be, when my master, the sovereign, rests with his fathers, that I and my son, Shilamo, shall be considered sinners. King David placed Solomon on the throne, because if he didn't, then Bathsheba and Solomon would have been killed. This unfortunately led to his son Adonai's death later on, when he asked for the Shulamite woman as his bride, and Solomon killed his brother without hesitation. The sins of the father carried on to his children. Sheba would return again to bring sin to King Solomon. 1 Kings 10.1 And the sovereignness of Sheba heard the report of Shilamo concerning the name of Yahuwah and came to try him with hard questions. And she came to Jerusalem with a very great company, with camels that bore spices, very much gold and precious stones. And she came to Shilamo and she spoke with him about all that was in her heart. And Shilamo answered all of her questions. There was no matter hidden from the sovereign that he did not make known to her. And the sovereignness of Sheba saw all the wisdom of Shilamo and the house that he had built, and the food on his table, and the seating of his servants, and the service of his waiters, and their attire, and his cupbearers, and his ascending offerings, which he offered in the house of Yahuwah, and there was no more spirit in her. Then she said to the sovereign, The word I heard in my own land about your words and about your wisdom was true, but I did not believe the words until I came and saw with my own eyes. And see, I have not been told the half. Your wisdom and prosperity exceed the report which I hear. Blessed are your men, and blessed are these your servants, who stand continually before you, who are hearing your wisdom. Blessed be Yahuwah your Elohim, who delighted in you, to put you on the throne of Israel, because Yahuwah has loved Israel forever. Therefore he made you sovereign to do right ruling and righteousness. And she gave the sovereign one hundred and twenty talents of gold, and very many spices and precious stones. Never again did so many spices come as the sovereignness of Sheba gave to sovereign Shilamo, and also the ships of Haran, which brought gold from Ephar, brought Almag wood in great many, and precious stones from Ophar. And the sovereign made steps of Almag wood for the house of Yahuwah, and for the sovereign's house, also lyres and harps for singers. No such Almag wood has come or has been seen to this day. And Sovereign Shilamo gave the Sovereignness of Sheba all she desired, whatever she asked, besides what he gave her according to the hand of Sovereign Shilamo. As she turned and went to her land, she and her servants, and the weight of gold that came to Shilamo yearly 
with 666 talents of gold. Notice that Sheba gave Solomon gold, which it says a king should not accept in Deuteronomy 17. Deborim, Deuteronomy 17, 15. You shall certainly set a sovereign over you, whom Yahweh your Elohim shall choose. Set a sovereign over you among your brothers. You are not allowed to set a foreigner over you, who is not your brother. Only he is not to increase horses for himself, nor cause the people to return to Mitzrayim to increase horses. For Yahuwah has said to you, Do not return that way again. And he is not to increase wives for himself, lest his heart be turned away. Nor is he to greatly increase silver and gold for himself. 1 Kings 10.10 10. And she gave Sovereign 120 talents of gold and very many spices and precious stones. Never again did so many spices come as the Sovereign of Shepsheba gave to the Sovereign Shilamo. 1 Kings 10.14 And the weight of gold that came to Shilamo yearly was 666 talents of gold. All this gold goes against what it says in Deuteronomy 17.17. 17. But his father, King David, prayed that he would receive the gold from the land of Sheba. You can see this prayer for him in Psalm 72. Psalm 72.10 Let the sovereigns of Tarshish and of the Isles bring presents. The sovereigns of Sheba and Seba offer gifts. And let all sovereigns bow down before him. All nations serve him. And since Solomon asked for wisdom from Yahuwah instead of riches, Yahuwah blessed him with riches. 1 Kings 3.11 So Elohim said to him, Because you have asked this, and not asked long life for yourself, nor have asked riches for yourself, nor have asked the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself discernment to understand right ruling. See, I shall do according to your words. See, I shall give you a wise and understanding heart, so that there is none like you before you, and none like you shall rise after you. And I shall also give you what you have not asked, both riches and esteem, so that there shall not be anyone like you among the sovereigns all your days. Deuteronomy 17.16 only he is not to increase horses for himself, nor cause the people to return to Mitzrayim to increase horses, for Yahweh has said to you, Do not return that way again. Notice also in Deuteronomy 17.16, it says that the king is not to increase horses for himself. But right after Sheba left, Solomon gathered many horses. 1 Kings 10 And Shilamo gathered chariots and horsemen, and he had 1,400 chariots and 12,000 horsemen, whom he stationed in the chariot cities and with the sovereign in Jerusalem. It also says in Deuteronomy 17:17 17, 17, that the king is not to increase wives for himself, lest his heart turn away. And Solomon had many multitudes of wives. Deuteronomy 17:17. 17, 17, and he is not to increase wives for himself, lest his heart turn away. Nor is he to greatly increase silver and gold for himself. 1 Kings 11.1 1. And the sovereign Shilamo loved many foreign women, in addition to the daughter of Pharaoh. Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Zidonian, and Hittite women, from the nations of whom Yahuwah had said to the children of Israel, you do not go into them, and they do not go into you. For they shall certainly turn away your hearts after their mighty ones. Shilamo clung to these in love, and he had seven hundred wives, princesses, and three hundred concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. And it came to be, when Shilamo was old, that his wives turned away his heart after other mighty ones. And his heart was not perfect with Yahuwah his Elohim, as was the heart of his father David. And Shilamo went after Ashtaroth, the mighty one of the Sidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Amorites. Thus Shilamo did evil in the eyes of Yahuwah, and did not follow Yahuwah completely like his father David. 
It was not the gold that was bad, it is what Solomon did with the gold. Because the third commandment of Yahuwah says, You do not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of that which is in the heavens above, or which is in the earth beneath, or which is in the waters under the earth. Exodus 24 Solomon took some of the gold and made idols of lions with it. 1 Kings 10.18 And the sovereign made a great throne of ivory and overlaid it with refined gold. The throne had six steps, and the top of the throne was round at the back, and there were armrests on either sides of the place of the seat, and two lions stood beside the armrests, and twelve lions were standing there, one on each side of the six steps. The like of was never made in any rain. Notice that he made lions out of gold. This is strictly against the Ten Commandments. 1 Kings 11.7 then Shilamo built a high place for Chemos, the abomination of Moab, on the hill that is east of Jerusalem, and for Moloch, the abomination of the children of Ammon. And so he did for all his foreign wives, who burned incense and slaughter to their mighty ones. Sheba was the destroyer that showed up and led Shilamo into idolatry and breaking the commands just like the Moabite women that led Israel astray in Numbers 25. By Midbar, Numbers 25.1, And Israel dwelt in Shittim, and the people began to whore with the daughters of Moab, and they invited the people to the slaughterings of their mighty ones, and the people ate and bowed down to their mighty ones. Thus Israel was joined to Baal Peor, and the displeasure of Yahuwah burned against Israel. Sheba's name means seven, and it was the queen of Sheba that led Solomon astray first. Could it be that he wrote Proverbs 7 about Sheba, the name that means both seven and the oath? Mishli, Proverbs 7.1 My son, guard my words and treasure up my commands with you. Guard my commands and live and my Torah as the apple of your eye. Bind them on your fingers. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Say to wisdom you are my sister, and call understanding a close friend, to guard you against a strange woman, against a foreigner who flatters with her words. For at the window of my house I looked through my lattice, and I saw among the simple, and I perceived among the youth, a young man lacking heart, passing through the street near her corner, and he went the way to her house in the twilight, in the evening, in the black and the dark night. And look, a woman met him, dressed like a whore, with a hidden heart. She was boisterous and stubborn. Her feet did not stay at her own house. Now in the street, now in the square, and at every corner she lurks. And she took hold of him and kissed him. She hardened her face and said to him, Slaughterings of peace offerings are with me, Today I have paid my vows. Therefore I came out to meet you, to earnestly seek your face, and I found you. I have spread my bed with coverings, colored linens of Mitzrayim. I have sprinkled my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let us take our fill of carnal love until morning. Let us delight ourselves with love. For my husband is not at home, he is gone on a long journey. He took a bag of silver with him, he comes home on the day of the covering. With her many words she leads him astray, with her smooth lips she seduces him. He goes after her immediately, like an ox he goes to the slaughter, and as in chains a fool to the punishment till an arrow strikes through his liver like a bird rushing to a snare and did not know that it would take his life. And now listen to me, you children. Pay attention to the words of my mouth. Do not let your heart turn aside to her ways. Do not go astray to her paths, for many are the wounded she has caused to fall, and numerous are her killed ones. Her house is the way to Sheol, going down to the rooms of death.
Sounds a lot like Shiva with the choice spices of myrrh and the aloe wood tree, which is very similar to the almog wood tree mentioned in 1 Kings 10:11. Notice it mentions six different nations where the wives that he turned his heart to worshiping their mighty ones came from. Number one was Egypt, the daughter of Pharaoh. Number two, the Moabite women. Number three, Ammonite. Number four, Edomite. Number five, Sidonian. And number six, the Hittite. And that would make Sheba number seven, like her name that means seven. And there are many different references that claim they even had a child together. Quote, the Beta Israel, meaning House of Israel, themselves claim descent from Menelik I, traditionally the son of Queen of Sheba, Makeda, and King Solomon. Askum has long been regarded as a holy city for the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. It forms the setting of the 14th century work, Kibra Nagast, Glory of the Kings, which relates to tradition of the transference of the Ark of the Covenant from Jerusalem to Askum by King Menelik I, legendary son of Solomon and Queen of Sheba, Makeda. The Sabians, or the Kingdom of Sheba, were considered a pagan nation, and it appears that the Queen of Sheba was one of the first to turn Solomon's heart away from Yahuwah. The Sheba kingdom was a pagan country who were astronomers and star worshippers. Quote, Apart from the Sabians of Haran, there were also various religious groups living in the Mesopotamia marshes who were called Sabians of the marshes. Though this name has often been understood as a reference to the Mandaeans, there was in fact at least one other religious group living in the marshlands of southern Iraq. This group still held on to the pagan belief related to Babylonian religion, in which Mesopotamian gods had already been venerated in the form of planets and stars since antiquity. End quote. Quote, the pagan worshipping kingdom of Sheba, ancient Saba, certainly existed and it had a great number of queens throughout its two millennia controlling the incense trade around the Red Sea and Arabia. The frankincense burnt by the high priest as offerings to the gods of ancient Egypt and the temples along the River Nile had to be of the highest possible quality. So did the myrrh used in the complicated process of mummifying a pharaoh's body before burial inside the lavishly decorated tomb. The best quality of both of these tree resins, Boswella sacra and the Comphora myrrha, grows in the region of Dofar in the southern Arabia. To what extent Sabian territory stretched across the Red Sea from South Arabia to Africa is debatable, but the corridors of this incense trade push deep into the Ethiopian highlands en route to the great natural highway of northeast Africa, the river now running northwards to Egypt. End quote. Quote, there are references to the worship of numerous deities throughout the books of Kings. Solomon builds temples to many deities, and Josiah is reported to have cutting down the statues of Astaroth in the temple Solomon built for Yahuwah. 2 Kings 23.14 Josiah's grandfather Manasseh had erected one such statue in 2 Kings 21.7 End quote. Quote, Interesting finds at Beersheba In an expedition from Tel Aviv University led by Professor Johan Arani excavated extensively at Beersheba in 1971 the town was found to be a well-planned city erected in Solomon's time, 3.5 acres in the area and surrounded by a wall 13 feet thick. The temple is yet to be excavated. In a corner of the temple area, however, the archaeologists found a rich hall of ritual vessels of Egyptian origin. 
bronze figurines of a goddess, a bull, a phoenix, and Egyptian double crown amulets and beads as well as clay human figurines were discovered in a heap in debris of a brick house. There was also a small incense altar and an incense burner of bone in the shape of a lion. This shows archaeological evidence of the pagan worship of the mother goddess that always sits on top of a lion, which we will show more of later in this video. Quote, Recent archaeological discoveries in the Milham Bilkis, Mahram Bilkis, Temple of the Moon Deity, and Marib, Yemen, support the view that the Queen Sheba ruled over southern Arabia, with evidence suggesting the area to be the capital of the Kingdom of Sheba. Quote, the Temple of Awam, or Maram Bilkis, Sanctuary of the Queen of Sheba, is a Sabian temple dedicated to the principal deity of Saba, Al-Maka, frequently called Lord of Awam, near Marib in what is now Yemen. The temple is situated seven kilometers southeast of ancient Marib and was built in the outskirts of the city. Quote, the ruling dynasty of Saba regarded themselves as his seed. Amaka is represented on monuments by a cluster of lightning bolts surrounding a curved, sickle-like weapon. Bulls were sacred to him. Quote, the ancient Sabiac Awan temple known in folklore as Mahram, the sanctuary of Bilkas, was recently excavated by archaeologists but no trace of the Queen of Sheba has been discovered so far in the many inscriptions found there. Quote, the oldest inscription found in the complex was in reference to the building of the temple's massive enclosure called the Great Wall of Awam by Mukarib Yada il Dare one in the middle of the 7th century BCE indicating much earlier period of the temple's construction. Yada'il inscription was carved outside the wall and contains the following. Yada'il Dara, son of Sumha Allah, Makrib of Seba, walled Aram, the temple of Amaka, when he sacrificed to Athar and when he established the whole community united by a god and a patron and a pact and a secret treaty by Athar and Habas and by Amaka. Notice in this inscription that it says he made a pact and a secret treaty. The word Sheba means both oath and seven. The fallen angels made a secret treaty amongst themselves at Mount Hermon. But before we discuss the fallen angels, let's look at who Athar is. Quote, According to Gray, Nielsen suggested that Athar tradition from South Arabia reflects an earlier stratum of Semitic religion. Nielsen posits that the Athar of the Ugaritic text is to be identified with Athar of South Arabian pantheon. In this setting, he is the son of the moon god Il and the sun goddess Atharat and the deification of the Venus star, the brightest of the celestial bodies after the sun and moon. Quote, Dehud noted the Athar usually heads up list of South Arabian deities and is considered to be the head of the pantheon in the region. For him, this datum and supporting evidence from ancient Mesopotamia indicates that Athar was an astral god identified with the planet Venus. He noticed that in Arabia he is known as the Eastern One, and that in Mesopotamia Arcadian Ishtar was equated to Sumerian Dilbat, the name by which Venus was known. Quote, the Sabians of Shiva also recognize Athar. For them, however, he is superseded by Amaka, the planet Venus, and therefore is identical with Astarte. Quote, Atar is an ancient Semitic deity whose role, name, and even gender varied by cultures of West Asia. In both genders, Athar is identified with the planet Venus, 
the morning and evening star. In some manifestations of Semitic mythology, the name appears in various Semitic languages as the feminine form of Ishtar in Arcadian and the masculine form Atar in Arabic and the masculine form Astar in Ethiosemitic. Quote, Shalim along with Sahar is described as a twin children of El. Both are gods of the planet Venus and were considered by some to be the twined avatar of the god Athar as the markers of dawn and dusk. Sahar and Shalim also represented the temporal structure of the day. Quote, Shalim is a god in Canaanite religion mentioned in inscriptions found in Ugarit in Syria. William F. Albright identified Shalim as the god of dusk and Shahar as the god of the dawn in dictionaries of deities and demons in the Bible. Shalim is identified as a deity representing Venus or the evening star and Shahar the morning star. His name derives from the triconsonantal Semitic root S-L-M. Quote, Shahar is the god of dawn in the pantheon of Eucharist. Shahar is described as the child of El along with a twin, Shalim, the god of dust, as the markers of dawn and dust. Shahar and Shalim also represented the temporal structure of the day. Look at this verse in Isaiah 14 verse 12. How are you fallen from heaven, Lucifer, son of the morning? How are you cut down to the ground, you who weakened on the nations? Notice in this passage, Lucifer's name is Hallel, and the morning is Sahar, the deity that we just mentioned as Venus. Quote, in some versions of the myth, Ishtar became a star of the Pleiades, Shemyaza a star in Orion. Ishtar's name, of course, comes from the Mesopotamian goddess of the same name, who is identified with the planet Venus, then thought to be a star and the brightest object in the sky. Job 38.31 Can you bind the cluster of the Pleiades or the belt of Orion loose? The word for bind in this passage is Hebrew Strong's 71.94, Kashar which means to bind, league together, or conspire. And the word for cluster is Hebrew Strong's 4575, Ma Adana, which means bonds, bands, or fetters, like the chains placed on prisoners. This coincides perfectly with Enoch. Chapter 10, verse 11, And Yahuwah said to Michael, Go bind Simeasa and his associates, who have united themselves with women so as to have defiled themselves with them in all their uncleanliness. Hanuk Enoch 18.13 I saw there seven stars like burning mountains, and to me, when I inquired regarding them, the messenger said, This place is the end of the Shamayim and earth. This has become a prison for the stars and the host of the Shamayim, and the stars which roll over the fire are they which transgressed the commandment of Yahuwah in the beginning of their rising, because they did not come forth at their appointed times, and he was wroth with them, and bound them till the time when their guilt should be completely ended for ten thousand years. And Uriel said to me, here shall stand the messengers who have connected themselves with women and their spirits, assuming many forms, are defiling mankind, and shall lead them astray into sacrificing to demons as mighty ones, till the day of the great judgment in which they shall be rightly ruled, till they are made an end of, and the women also of the messengers who went astray shall become demons. Notice that it says these fallen angels represent the seven stars, just as mentioned in Job 38.31 as the Pleiades. Quote, the Sabeti and its variations are typically translated with a meaning along the lines of seven, group of seven, or seven of them. 
They are always presented as masculine deities and are kin in one way or another, either brothers or half-brothers. Their most prominent characteristic across all versions is their warlike nature. The Sabeti can be anthropomorphic representation of the Pleiades or another stellar or atmospheric phenomenon. Quote, According to cuneiform sources, the Pleiades figure are among the most important stars. They are simply known in Sumerian as the stars Mumu, while their Arcadian name, the Bristol Zapu, links them to the imagery and cultural melo of the Bull of Heaven constellation Taurus, to which they belong. Pleiades are frequently depicted as seven dots or seven stars and identified on a mythological level with groups of seven divine beings. In fact, the Sumerian idiom for seven is preceded by the determinative for divine beings, Dimni B, can be used as an alternative name for Pleiades. Besides, they also show a close relation to the seven demons called the seven Sabetu a well-known group of evil beings that, according to an etiological myth, causes the eclipse of the moon. The relation of the Pleiades to the war and death spear is strengthened by their association with the netherworld god Negral Era, as well as their identification with the god's planet Mars. Notice in this inscription in the Sheba temple of Amaka that they made a secret pact, just as the fallen angels did in Enoch chapter 6. And it came to pass, when the children of men had multiplied, that in those days were born unto them beautiful and comely daughters. And the angels, the children of the heaven, saw and lusted after them, and said to one another, Come, let us choose us wives from among the children of men, and beget us children. And Shemyaza, who was their leader, said unto them, I fear ye will not indeed agree to this deed, and I alone shall have to pay the penalty of a great sin. And they all answered him and said, Let us all swear an oath, and all bind ourselves by mutual imprecations, not to abandon this plan, but to do this thing. Then swear they all together and bound themselves by mutual imprecations upon it. And they were in all two hundred who descended in the days of Jared on the summit of Mount Hermon. And they called it Mount Hermon because they had sworn and bound themselves by mutual imprecations upon it. The word Shiva means both seven and oath. There were originally seven fallen angel leaders, and they made an oath on Mount Hermon. Yahusha mentions Sheba returning during the time of the judgment in Matthew 12, but he first mentions Nineveh, Matthew Yahu, Matthew 12:39. But he answering said to them, A wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign shall be given to it except the sign of the prophet Yonah. For as Yonah was three days and three nights in the stomach of the great fish, so shall the son of Adam be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Men of Nineveh shall stand up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it, because they repented at the preaching of Yonah. And look, a greater than Yonah is here. Yahusha is telling them that he would be crucified and put in the ground by their hand. And even though many are worshiping idols, they will not repent. Even though the Messiah had come to them, the city of Nineveh was full of wickedness and idolatry, just as the world was when Yahusha came, and as it is today. Jonah 1.1 And the word of Yahuwah came to Jonah, son of Amidai saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry out against it, for their evils have come up before me. According to many scholars, 
The book of Nahum occurred 140 years after the book of Jonah, and the city of Nineveh had resorted back to their old evil ways. So the book of Nahum gives us clues to how Nineveh was when they repented of their evil in the days of Jonah. Nahum 1.11 From you came forth one who plots evil against Yahuwah, a counselor of Belial. Thus said Yahuwah, Though they are strong and many, even so they shall be cut off and pass away. Though I have afflicted you, I afflict you no more. So now I break this yoke from you and tear off your shackles. As you can see, they were plotting evil against Yahuwah, and just as then, the Pharisees were plotting evil against Yahusha. Nahum 1.14 And Yahuwah has commanded concerning you, Your name shall no longer be sown. From the house of your mighty ones I shall cut off the carved image and the molded image, and I shall appoint your burial site, for you have been of no account. As you can see, they were worshipping idols, which is demon worship. This is most likely why Yahusha mentions Nineveh along with the demons mentioned later in the chapter of Matthew 12. Kasson, Revelation 6, 4 And another horse, fiery red, went out, and it was given to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth, and that they should slay one another. And a great sword was given to him. Yahusha was telling them in Matthew 12, that mankind would not repent of their evil at the last judgment and this coincides perfectly with what we see in Revelation chapter 9 verse 20 and the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands that they should not worship the demons and idols of gold and of silver and of brass and of stone and of wood which are neither able to see nor to hear or to walk and they did not repent of their murders, nor of their drug sorceries, nor of their whoring, nor of their thefts. Revelation 16, 9 And men were burned with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of Elohim, who possesses authority over these plagues, and they did not repent to give him esteem. Revelation 16, 11, And they blasphemed the Elohim of the heaven for their pains and their sores and did not repent of their works. Yahusha said the men of Nineveh would rise up in the judgment because mankind would not repent, just as we have seen in Revelation. And we have seen that Nineveh was worshiping these seven demons, just as mankind will be in the end of days when the great judgment when these fallen ones and all that worship them will be rightly judged as we have seen in Enoch if man would just take a lesson from the city of Nineveh when Jonah brought them the message Jonah 3 5 and the men of Nineveh believed in Elohim and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. And the word reached the sovereign of Nineveh, and he rose from his throne and took off his robe and covered himself with sackcloth and sat in ashes. And he proclaimed and said throughout Nineveh, by decree of the sovereign and his nobles, no man or beast, herd or flock, shall taste whatever. Let them not eat, let them not even drink water, but let man and beast be covered in sackcloth and call mightily to Elohim and let each one turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands.